Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. Hi, I'm Barry Rowland. And in this episode, we're going to be reviewing the Fnatic CSL Elite wheel system. Now, this is the officially licensed PlayStation 4 version of their wheelbase system. And it's been actually a, a pretty long time since I've had a Fnatic wheelbase system in the Sim Racing Garage for review. And I'm really looking forward to doing the review on this one. So let's get to it. Now let's take a look at the actual wheel and what you get with your wheel when you order it. First, let's look at the accessories real quick. You guys have probably seen a lot of this before, but we'll just take a quick look at it. First, we'll look at the desk clamp. And it is the standard plastic with the little ribs everywhere to reinforce it with the beveled insert that has the matching bevel over here on the bolt that we're going to fix it with. And of course, that just goes in there and lets this plastic piece float. So when we mount it to our desk, that it is able to really get a nice bite into it and hold the wheel firmly, hopefully. We also have these floaters. They're self-leveling feet. They have a little rubber on them. So again, pretty much the standard fare for these kind of wheels in the market today. And nothing fancy, but they do get the job done. And then, well, they just work. By the way, maximum is like 2.3 inches or six centimeters on as far as the depth that you can mount this. Right, we also have this nice USB cable they included, and you can see it actually has two ferrite cores on it. Very nice indeed. Um, hats off to Fnatic for giving us a quality USB cord with their wheel. And I know a lot of folks say, well, that's really not that big of a deal, but if you've ever spent a few hours running down EMI issues on your rig, then yeah, every bit of insurance that you can get is a good thing really so we also get a power supply and this is a 24 volt seven and a half amp unit with the standard universal plug on one side and we have another look at this another ferrite core on the power supply very neat indeed so yeah and it's got some good heft to it so it, it feels like it's a pretty good power supply now i've got these two cords which are European cords, which I can't use, but no big deal. I've got, obviously, a, maybe 10 or 12 of <laughs> these cords that are USA cords that have the universal end on it, so no big deal there. And what else we got? Some spare parts. Well, not really spare parts, but we have the bolt that we're going to use to cinch this wheel to the motor when we actually do that. And, of course, they give you an Allen wrench to accommodate you. We have an O-ring that goes on the steering wheel shaft that mates between the wheel quick release and the shaft. Of course, that's not really a quick release, but we'll get to that. And we've got these little washers here. Now these washers, uh, according to the, what I'm reading here, are for the static shifter accessory that's available for this wheelbase. Now, I'm not sure why they gave you these washers without the shifter. Uh, I hope the shifter will have the washers too when you get one if you ordered the static shifter. But yeah, I'm not sure why those are there, but there they are. And we've got these buttons to play with. And obviously, if you're not using this for a PlayStation and you don't want to be staring at PlayStation buttons while you're driving your race car, then yeah, uh, you can use these buttons in their place. Easy enough to take off and put on. You just get a fingernail, let's say this triangle here, on either side of it, and it pops right off. And it's got these little arms here. A little claw here that snaps in and out. And then we just take one of these out, which have also have these little claws on them, and put them back in. Easy enough. I'll be using this on a PlayStation, so I'm just going to go ahead and pop that one back in. Now, as far as the durability of this from popping them in and out, depending on how often you do it, I guess, we'll just have to wait and see if anybody has problems with that. But a nice feature. They also threw in these buttons that don't fit this wheel. And... That's so that if you have another Fnatic wheel that doesn't have the PlayStation indicators on it, you can use that wheel on this base in PlayStation and replace or actually cover some existing buttons with these buttons. An example would be this over here, my heavily modified <laughs> Fnatic F1 wheel that I really like, by the way. And yeah, these buttons here can be covered with these buttons if I was going to use this on a PlayStation. But of course, I have a USB conversion on this and I'm not using it on a PlayStation. But it's a nice thought that Fnatic actually threw those in. Right, anything else? Oh, I think that's about it. Let's get to the actual wheel and base. First look at the wheel. 
Of course, it's not cinched on. It's pulled right off. First thing, you get it in hand. It feels pretty good. And that's one thing about Fnatic that I've always liked, except for just one of the wheels. All the other wheels I've ever gotten from Fnatic felt good in the hand. I mean, they just do that well. They do a good job on the finish, the, the quality. They always look like quality wheels when you get them in hand. And yeah, this one feels the same way. This one has around the rim perforated leather and it's real leather. It uh, survives or passes rather the sniff test for leather. It has some, they call in this suede, but I don't know if that's real leather suede or not, but um, it feels good. It's uh, not El Carta, is that how you say that? And it's, if it's suede, it's not the same kind of suede that is on like the real racing wheels like Momo's and OMP's and such. It's really close cropped. I don't know if you can see that. But it's got a good feel to it. It just feels very thinnish. Very thin. So, but of course, I'm sure that doesn't really matter either way because most times you're going to be gripping the leather up here. And it has this nice blue stitching that's actually quite well done. I like that. Blue's one of my favorite colors too. So how did Fanatic know that? <laughs> right. Uh, anything on the front? Really nothing special going on here. We have this... Uh, little joystick, if you will, that does it is also a button, but it's not a rotary. So you can't twist this thing. You can't turn it, even though it has an O-ring on it. I thought that's what it was when I first saw it, but no, you can't turn that. So that's not the, what the, uh, the funky switch they call that? I'm not sure. Whatever. I'm just calling it a joystick with a button. <laughs> right. So not much else to see on the front. Nice brushed uh, look, by the way, on this aluminum front here. And this is a very light wheel, and one of the reasons is, if you look at that aluminum in the shiny part there, that's three mil thick. So that makes for a nice light wheel. This thing is 970, yeah, 970 grams. Very light wheel. Um, maybe too light? I don't know. We're going to find out once we start driving with it. But yeah, it feels good in hand. It's got a great uh, lightweight feel. And of course, a light wheel means we get more tactile feedback from our force feedback motor that's linked up to a belt inside of this base here. So let's go to the back. The shifter's very nice. Actually, I was surprised. Uh, I forget the name that Fnatic uses for this, the marketing name for this little click sensation they put in here. But yeah, when I first got that F1 wheel over there, it was just the, you know, they, it worked fine, but there was no tactile feel when you made your shift. What you felt was the end of the travel of the shifter. And that's the indication that, well, okay, I made my shift. Well, that is not the case anymore with these. You can actually feel it snap. So, and then it stops to the full travel. So I really like that. It's not, it doesn't make a lot of noise, which is typical for you know the Fnatic shifters. And you don't want to make a lot of noise if you're racing next door to someone or if someone's in the next room. And yeah, they feel good. Not crazy about the arrows on them though. Not sure why they still do that. I don't think it would take any of you guys very long to figure out what the upshift and the downshift is and not need the arrows anymore, but you know, it's just one of those things they do. The LED, or not the LED, but the readout up here, the shift light, and we've got either a gear indicator or how fast we're going. I'll probably just use the gear indicator. You know, I wasn't crazy about this when I first saw it. I think it was a Porsche wheel when I first got the Porsche wheel, but it grew on me very quick. I really liked it once it was in use and I was actually using it, so yeah. It's something that kind of grows on you. It's nice just to look over your wheel and see what's going on and, and get the indication you need to shift instead of looking through the wheel at the car's dash if you're running in like a set of course or eye racing or something. Right, so anything else? Yes, that's a big chunk of plastic back here. And that's where a lot of weight savings is, obviously. This quick release or the, the part, that really not a quick release, the part that attaches this wheel to the steering shaft is non-removable so it is what it is here you can't change this out to the springy quick release like you can on some other fanatic wheels that come with this type of cinching system and it's kind of flexy and of course it's made to be flexy with these slots in it obviously that's how it cinches down on the shaft but still i just don't have a, it's not confidence inspiring if you will i'm not sure how well this is going to work as far as you know flexing of the wheel but we'll see once we get it on there it got a little pin here that keeps this from going anywhere, which is nice, or it would, I'm sure, go somewhere quick. It's a very thin band. It's almost like a, one of the ones you'll buy at the store to use on a radiator hose or something. I don't know if you can see how thin that is there, but I'm trying to give you a shot of it. But yeah, pretty thin. And again, overall, 
just not the most confidence inspiring cinching system but i'm sure it does a, it'll hold it on there or fanatic wouldn't be using it All right let's get to the wheelbase itself and actually i like the front of this better than the xbox version i remember when that came out it had that checkerboard thing going on with the pattern on it and i'm sure some people love it but yeah i wasn't a big fan of it i, I like this this is much better i think it's a much cleaner look and I like the way they have these raised letters. When you get one of these wheelbases, the first thing you do, when you see it's a, you gotta run your finger across these raised letters over here on the CSL Elite thing too. Now I'm gonna flip this up so you can see how much they kind of stick up there from the flat plate there. And this flat plate, by the way, it looks like brushed aluminum, but I'm, yeah, it's plastic. It's not aluminum, but it actually looks like aluminum. So they did a good job with that. I don't know how well it's showing up in the video, but. Yeah, I was surprised. I thought for sure that was aluminum front when I first took it out, but yeah, it, you can see down in here, this little edge here is plasticky. I don't know if you can see that little reflection. It's kind of a bevel going down around the shaft here. So we also have the screw mounts for those forementioned static shifters, if you want to run those. And there was a time, I don't know if he still makes them, DSD actually made some um, actual button boxes you could bolt in and use these holes to help bolt that in but really they're meant for static shifters so if you buy the sh static shifter accessory then you just bolt them on and you're good to go so anything else we will see here standard mode button power button so nothing else going on there we do have our leds for rpm indicator on the top and speaking of the top we've got some vent holes cut on both sides here and i don't know if you can see it or not i can barely see it but you can see some wiring in there and what that is, is, I don't know if you guys will be able to see it, but anyway, once we crack it open, we'll see, get a better look at it. There's a fan sitting right in there. It's pulling, I'm imagining it's pulling the air in here and blowing it out the back vent here, but I'll find out once we, maybe we fire it up. So that's the cooling element. Uh, no filtering anywhere, so if you're in a dusty environment, then that dust will be blown all over the insides of your motor. But again, that goes with anything, not just this motor base. Your computer does the same thing, unless it has filtering, of course. Right. Anything else you want to see here on the back? We we're just looking at that. Is the connections, of course, the standard. Let's flip it up so you can read it, I guess. The standard things that we can connect. A couple of shifters over here. Shifter, shifter. And then we have the pedals. Or if you don't have a USB way to connect your pedals, then you connect them right into here. And also we have the handbrake, USB, and power. Simple, usual stuff going on here on the back of these cases. And actually, we can see all the wiring in there. Ooh, I can't wait to get this cracked open. Now I can see all that stuff in there. <laughs> right, on the bottom. Well, we got the main mount hole here. It's threaded. That's an actually an M10 1.5 pitch. And I'm going to be flat mounting this. So that means I've got to pull these little feet off. These come off. It's just a couple of screws in there. So we'll pull these feet off, and then we'll use the three M6 bolt holes there. And by the way, this does not come with M6 bolts. You have to source your own if you're going to be flat mounting it. But it is nice that they put these little rubber tabs here. So when you do flat mount, they've got these little, it's kind of a, a stickiness to it that will help hold it to the surface. But remember, if you're flat mounting, you could always drill another hole if you wanted to and put an M10 bolt in there to make this even more of a solid mount. But I think the three will probably suffice, but we'll see once we get it cinched down on the plate that I'll be using to mount this with. Right. Not much else to see here, I guess. Some more vents for cooling over here. Oh yeah, one thing I want to show you on the side. First I thought, oh nice, carbon fiber uh, stickers or side there, but it's really not. It's just some stripes. It's not even a cross pattern like you would see in a carbon fiber thing. And these are just stickers. I'm pretty sure these are just stickers because on one side, see it's not this side. I think it's this side. Yeah, there it is. There's kind of like a little air bubble in there. I don't know how, if I can get that to show up on the lights here. But we'll give it a shot. It's right here. And let's see. I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but there's a little air bubble right there. So that makes me believe, yeah, this is not really molded into the plastic sides. It's just a sticker they put on there. All right. That's about it. The wheelbase, six newton meters. We got a single belt drive, but we're going to see all that. The direct position sensor is supposed to be on the shaft, I would imagine, from the description that is on their website. And remember, they used to have it on the back of the motor, and that caused some problems with positioning accuracy as time wore on with certain wheels, and they're not doing that anymore, but 
I'm not totally 100% sure that it's actually attached to here, but again, that's why we take these things apart and look inside, which is exactly what we're going to do next. So our next segment on this will be go ahead and take it apart or take the covers off and see how everything's working inside. So now it's time for the fun part when we get to look inside and see exactly how this motor is working. Right. First off, there's going to be some screws we have to take off. There's, if you just want to take the top cover off, you can see it say, you can't see a seam here. This is all one play on the front. But on the sides, if you look at it, you can see there's a seam that runs that way and it continues on through the back and around, obviously, on the other side. So we can actually just take the top off and we'll do that first. And that's actually one, two, three, four Phillips screws on the front and deep in the sockets under here on these holes. There's one here, there's one over here, and of course we got a couple on the bottom. I don't know if you'll be able to see that, but yeah, that's where some Phillips screws are pretty deep down in there. So we're going to go ahead and pull those off first, and as usual I'll probably just speed this up for you. I'll be using my little drill here to make things go faster, and of course it's got the headlight on it so I can actually see way down in deep in these holes and get the screwdriver on the head properly. So let's see how we do here. So these are the usual screws that we find in these plastic cases, which is the aggressive wood looking screw there with the blunt tip on it. So just thought you guys would like to see that. So we got four of those on the bottom and now we're going to flip it around the and do the front and we're not going to need this big super long bit for that. We can go with a shorter one and we're going to do the same thing and these screws obviously we can you guys can see. Right, so let's go ahead and get those off. You can see that there's actually a different size here. These were on the bottom and these little ones are on the front. Now, I didn't have to take these two front ones off yet if I didn't want to, but I went ahead and did that because you know I'm going to be taking this front plate off. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> I, it, I'm going to go as far as I can go without really getting serious as far as having to disassemble something. So, theoretically that should, and there it is, now we're loose on the top. This whole top will come off. But of course, we have to be mindful that we have an LCD, or LED rather, little bar up here which means we've got electrical connections plus we have a fan connected to this top it's drawing air down into the box and out and kicking it out the back so when we take this off and there they are you can see those screw those wires in there let's turn this around this way let's get a little better look at it now these three here are going up to the fan over here and we'll get a better look at that once i get this loose what i'm going to do is instead of trying to take these guys off the top you know unplug it from up here and all this mess. It's easier if you look down in here on the board here, you can see that they've got some headers down in here that I'm going to pull these off so that we can get the top free and move on with our discovery. So there's the fan. They come off real easy, but you still want to be careful that you don't, if, they, if it's not coming off easy, then you want to be careful. Don't put too much pressure on it. Go ahead and get you some needle nose pliers or something and help it come off. And there we have it. Right. Easy enough. And there's our fan. And of course, this is spinning this way, I believe. Yes. I believe it's got to go that way to force the air down into the box. And of course, you can see that it's picking up through these air ducts here. And I've had this fun, this fan rather, <laughs> fun, had fun with it, but had this fan running a lot. In fact, I think it runs a little bit even when it's on all the time. It just runs. But yeah, I, I use it at full force feedback rates, and yeah, it was it was 
running pretty good there. It doesn't make a whole lot of noise, though. It's pretty quiet, actually, for what it does, I think. But then I'm not uh, trying to be real quiet with my equipment anyway. And there's the LEDs. You can see them all lined up nicely there on the top. All right, so much for the top. Now let's get to the business end. Now before I get further into this, I am going to... You see here, we've got some screws up here. I've got some down here, I've got one over here, and one over here. So, I need to take these off though, pretty sure. I don't think I have to take these off, because I don't see anything on the front, to get the front plate to come off. And that's what I want to do, to be able to show you exactly how all this is working. So what we have to do is take two more screws, and they're, they're actually, you can see them obviously right there, but they're down deep here, and I don't think you guys are going to be able to see them. I don't know, you might be able to see a reflection of it in there. But those are 2.5 millimeter pan head screws in there. So I just happen to have my handy Huddy 2.5 interchangeable driver. And I'm going to put this in here, and I'm going to be very careful with, with how I do this. I've got, got some plastic. You can see little bits of plastic around here, which you typically will get when you disassemble a plastic case because it's coming off the threads of the screws. There we go. So, I'm going to do this by hand. Because I, I don't want to mess up this hex set or even take a chance of doing that. And there's one. There it is. And you can see it's a little pan head unit. 2.5 mil on the top. And it looks like probably an M4. Not quite an M3. Could be an M3. Anyway, put that over here with the rest of the screws. So hopefully this will be the last one we have to do here to get this top off or the front rather. There we go. All right. We got our loose. Ah, there we go. Right. Nothing like everything coming off like it's supposed to. Well, let's see where we are now. Hopefully this thing will just come on off. Yeah, because we've already taken these two Phillips screws off on the bottom, it comes right off. But of course, we've got this stuff over here, these buttons. I'm going to be mindful, obviously, there's going to be some wires behind here, so we're going to look. And there they are, sitting right over here. And they're going back and twisting around and probably connecting to the circuit board in the back there. So probably the best thing we'd do, we could just lay this down, but I'm gonna be moving this around a lot. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull the plug out here. And it shouldn't be that big of a deal. Just kind of wiggle it a little bit as we pull it. There it goes. There we go. Easy enough. All right. And not much to see here. It's just your nice front plate. <laughs> Right. Okay, now we can see what's going on in here. And first thing we noticed, obviously, we've got this big, big gear here on the actual steering shaft. That's the main shaft, obviously. And as it turns, it's getting turns this gear right down here. See, I get this a little closer here so you can see it better. All right, so there's the gear turning. And it's very quiet, if you notice. That is a very quiet action there. And, of course, we have a pulley here, and we have a pulley on the top to keep everything tracking properly. And there doesn't look like to be any adjustment on these pulleys anywhere that I can see. If you look down inside of there, yeah, there's just no adjustments on these pulleys. So it's set at the factory, whatever tension it's supposed to be. Now, I know there are some guys out that have actually taken these pulleys off and replaced them with pulleys with sealed bearings in them. And bigger pulleys to tighten the belt down to give better force feedback fidelity so it's claimed and I, I'm not sure about all that but um, yeah I guess if you want to do that you could why not I mean you could do anything once you crack this thing open now one thing to note here is we have a sensor on here now Fanatic is calling this their direct position sensor and they're saying it's on the steering axis now instead of on the motor and that's what this little puppy here is and if you look closely at this piece up here, you can see, see that? You can actually see my wrench behind it. And, there, and you can see it's kind of got this mosaic kind of a pattern going on here. <laughs> but you can see right through it, basically, because there's tiny little slots in it. And what's what we call an optical wheel. So down in this sensor here, where these wires are hanging out, let's see if I can get you guys to see this well dropping this there we go so as this is turning down there you can see that slotted wheel is actually going in 
to this sensor down here. Oops, this sensor over here. All right, and that probably has a light shining through it. Typically, that's how these work. And it's breaking up the light beam as it turns. And that tells the system in the board here in the firmware what position this shaft is in. So when we're turning it, that's what's happening. It's, it's blocking the light, and then it's letting light through, blocking light, letting it through. Okay. So, easy enough. In fact, it even says, and I don't know if you guys are going to be able to see this, it says CSL position version 2, and I'm going to try to get this turned around where you can read that, but it's very small lettering. There it is. And again, we'll turn it this way so you guys can see. Yeah, see how that works? So there should be a light going through that slot there that this wheel is going through. All right. And a nice Gates belt on here. Same stuff you use in your car for your <laughs> pulley belts. <laughs> and it has the number on there in case you ever blow your belt out or wear it out. You can always get another one. Right. This is a plastic gear here. It seems like some kind of a hard plastic. It's definitely not steel or metal. And yeah, I, I wouldn't imagine it would have to be with a rubber belt around it. And now we can actually come over here and look at, we'll kind of move around this motor or this setup as we go along. Oh, by the way, there are no sealed bearings in these pulleys. They're just riding on a shaft. And you can see there's a ton of grease on them, which is a good thing. And I don't see, I, there might be a pulley in here, but I tell you what, I just don't see it. And on the back, I don't see, it looks like there's, not the pulley rather, but a bearing. But you can see it looks like a bearing right there, but I don't think that is. It could be. In, in fact, it might be pressed in. But then on the back, right in there, you can see there's kind of a, press fit for the shaft. So that might be a bearing back there. It's not moving and the shaft is, so it's a possibility. I just don't want to take the pulley off to find out. Right. So back around here. And we got the motor here. A six newton meter motor. Now I'm not sure. I'm not clear on whether that is six newton meter. Ooh, I'm getting grease all over me. Six newton meter peak power or if it's six newton meter steady power. And then there's something else for peak, like maybe 12 or something like that. Let me grab a little rag over here. That's the hazards of going inside of these things. You do get grease on you. Grease is good though. All right. Big, huge cooling fans on this motor. And of course the fan over here is situated right on top of that, those fins. So it's blowing right on top of it. It's not a very big looking motor for six newton meter, is it? <laughs> it's kind of small. And here's the thing. If you look here on the back of this motor, there's what looks like another position sensor. So I'm not sure what's going on here because they say that this front one is what's their new, as they call it, direct position sensor. So why is there a sensor? And I don't know if how well you're going to see this, but you can see the motor shaft in there. You might see it moving around. And there's a tip on there. It's probably got a magnet in it. And you can see that tip is located right above another chip, integrated circuit chip that's on this board which tells me that's also some kind of a position or rather position sensor. Right, so maybe we have two now. We have one on the motor and we have one on the front over here on, on the steering column and the algorithms and the firmware determine exactly where the wheel should be. That's the only thing I can think at this point of why it's there. Now also, if you'll notice, if you've looked at the older, ever had an older one of these open, this board was smaller, first of all, and it used an optical wheel on it. And it had only one Phillips screw holding the whole board behind the motor shaft. And that tended to, after a while, get loose and actually move around so that you didn't get accurate force feedback because it, it wasn't accurate that signal that it was getting from the board. And you had to go in and reposition the board, tighten the screw back down, that kind of thing. But now, if you look in here, I see three screws. Oh, well, you guys are going to see this, but there's three screws. There's a couple over here, and there's one on the, on the bottom part down there. So it's much more secure than it used to be. It's also a much bigger board than it used to be, but there's probably some other circuitry on there. And you can see we've got some nice size capacitors down there for power, probably filtering out the power signals. All right. Anything else we want to see down in here? Uh, I guess that's it. Now, of course, there's a, there's a main board underneath this whole assembly, and you can see an edge of it down there and then we can see the other edge obviously where we saw before coming around the front here or on the other side and you can see where all those headers are that we actually pulled those two plugs off of 
Now, I could go a little deeper, and that would mean taking a lot more bolts off, though, and then we could actually take this off. Now, if you turn this wheel enough, or the steering column enough, it actually has a stop in it, right? And we go the other way. It's about four turns. Long ways. And there's another stop. But it's not a knocking noise. I mean, it's kind of a soft, spongy stop. I'm not going to force it too far because I don't, don't want to mess anything up. So if we go back the other way, it's a harder stop to it. And typically, for stops on this kind of a design, hear that? So yeah, it's a harder stop there. Typically, there's a cam follower, if you will, that rides along some grooves or worm gear grooves cut into the shaft itself here. And it'll go back and forth and then stop at one side and stop at the other. And that's how the stops are implemented. And you can see here probably what this is. You see this little extra tunnel piece here? See how you guys can see that? That's probably what that is. If I took that top off and there's six screws there, you can see it comes off. But then I have to take this metal assembly out to get to the, what I need to get to to make that happen. So we'll just leave it alone. And yeah, so that's probably where that cam follower is riding back and forth as we're spinning this shaft up front. All right. Okay, anything else we want to see here? Really not much else to see. <laughs> it's pretty simple. You know, when you take these things off and you look at them, they're actually pretty simple. I'm trying to see if there's anything else that would let us know what this back board is all about. And I can't see any, I can't see MT-401. Yeah, it's not really saying what it's doing. Yep. So, a new, it is a number on it though, C-S-L-E-W-B, and then a serial number it looks like. But other than that, really no number on it. And I'll actually show you guys that number in case that might be valuable somewhere in the future. I guess you can see it all right there. Get the light. You never can get the light where you want it. There it is. Okay. Well, there it is. That's how it works. And I have to say, I have been running this wheel in six newton meters. It's, uh, it's got some good force in it. It really does. It's certainly more forceful or, or definitely stronger than, say, a G29 series or the uh, Thrustmaster T300. Yeah, right away, you know you got more force in hand with this thing because, yeah, it, it'll, it'll do the job. I'm, I've actually had fun driving this wheel. And, of course, there's some things that I don't like about it, but, yeah. I mean, there's nothing that I've ever seen that I, that I didn't have something I didn't like about it. But overall, yeah, it's doing a great job. And of course, I drove it first before I take it apart because I don't want to take it apart first and then find out I messed something up and then it I can't drive it anymore. So what I'm going to do now is put it back together and make sure it's working, of course. And then we'll put it back on the P1 rig and then we'll get to the actual driving portion after we see how it's mounted, the driving portion of the review. All right, so we're going to start out in iRacing on the Lotus 79. And that's the combination I usually use in iRacing to test all things hardware. And first off, the power is the first thing that hits you on this wheel. My settings on this wheel would pretty much just set the wheel settings to force feedback at 100 and everything else to zero and tune in game right up to where I was just clipping on the hardest hits going around corners and hitting curbing and such. So yeah, the power definitely gives you better force feedback experience than something that's lower powered. It definitely has more power and you feel it right away than something like a, if you were running a G29 or a Logitech uh, T300 RS, yeah, right away you feel the difference and I, I really liked what I was feeling comparatively speaking to those type of entry level wheels, even though of course they are less expensive than the Fnatic Elite. Right. The slides, uh, you can see in these corners here, I'm correcting really quickly because I can feel exactly what the car is doing, even though it's not as precise as some of the higher end stuff. It's good enough to get the job done and just gets on with letting you drive and push hard and be able to get the usual lap times that I get in this car at this track. So just saying that is a lot, I think, that it allowed me to do that with uh, a, a wheel that is normally not as strong as what I usually use. So, yeah, in iRacing, happy with it. It, it. I could use it all day long in iRacing and be happy and have fun with it. A set of Corsa, again, a set of Corsa is not my favorite feedbacks as far as force feedback. Some people love it over iRacing, and th again, that's totally subjective stuff we're talking about here, but same settings, 100%, and then just tune it a little bit 
and to whatever you want it to be as far as a set of quarters you know you got the, the advanced settings that you can go in and, and tune that force feedback there so I got it to where actually I liked it uh, more than I normally do with entry type level force feedback wheels so yeah the Ferrari was easy to handle I, I could feel a little bit better I thought where it was slipping where it wasn't and actually had a little bit better lap times with this wheel in a set of courses than I did with some of the other wheels right so Next, what we're going to do is go over to Project Cars 2 in the PC version first. And Project Cars, it is what it is with Project Cars and the force feedback, at least in my opinion, not the best in the world. And it can be very vague at times. But I have to say that this CSL Elite wheel did handle that rather well, better than some other wheels that I've actually used. I could actually control the car a bit more, even though it was still vague on the really very razor edge of the handling envelope when you're really pushing hard. It's still a little vague and you had to guess what you needed to do, but just like anything else, you got used to doing that. But yeah, project cars, what are you going to say? It, you know, the force feedback could be a lot better, I think, in that. And what we'll do next is go over to the PlayStation 4 version of project cars and actually I had a pretty good experience in the PlayStation with this wheel. I normally don't and I, I normally don't use a console for my racing anyway but here actually the wheel felt pretty good. I was actually able to control it a little bit more I think better than I actually did in the PC version which is totally different from what I'm used to feeling. But still it was you know Project Cars kind of vagueness and you know you, you did have to guess a little bit on what the car was going to do when you did a wheel input just because the force feedback cues just weren't there as acutely as they normally are. So, anyway, that'll wrap it up for the driving, and next we'll get on to the final thoughts. Final thoughts on the Fanatic CSL Elite Wheel System. The CSL Elite Wheel Set is Fanatic's entry-level solution. It has the famous Fanatic fit and finish that we have become accustomed to seeing. I've always liked the look of Fanatic's products pretty much. The wheel that is included with my officially licensed PlayStation 4 system is purpose made for this price point. Even so, it does have a nice finish to the front of it. With a combination of perforated leather on the hand contact points and suede on the rest of the rim, it feels very good in hand. But with the one piece plastic backing, including the built in wheel shaft clamp, it's not the stiffest wheel in Fanatic's lineup. There is some flex when pushing and pulling the rim when it is sitting stationary. But when you're using it, the flex is really not that noticeable to me. There's also some flex in the wheelbase itself, even when mounted with the recommended three 6mm screws. But at this price point, I really didn't expect it to be that solid. Still, the flex didn't bother me when I was driving. Although, <laughs> I was thinking that with less flex, the force feedback experience would be even better. Now, I'm not a fan of this metal band that is used to cinch down the wheel, but it does get the job done, so the wheel did not loosen over time. The six newton meter motor that drives this wheel has good power, certainly noticeably more power than say a G29 or T300 RS wheel, and it seems Fanatic has been able to use that power to good effect. The force feedback setting was usually set to 100 and with me just adjusting in game to avoid clipping and I was able to have a pretty good force feedback experience in most games. The force feedback also seemed to be able to convey the proper cues as far as the front end washing out or the rear end sliding. So I was able to handle most any car control situation without too much drama. The new direct sensor positioning design seems to be doing its job well. Now, the motor did not overheat on me when driving in hard, long sessions, although you could hear the fan working hard to keep things cool. Overall, I had a positive experience running the CSL Elite system, with my main concern being the flex. But, as most of you know, this is one of the things that I'm always looking for. <laughs> I think the main thing for potential buyers to consider here is whether or not you need the six newton meters of force feedback power as there are less expensive wheel systems out there that also do a good job, just not as much power. Now, personally, I always go for as much power as I can afford. <laughs> I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button and check out our website at simracinggarage.com.